Welcome to AUSA's Army Matters Podcast, focusing on what's important to the total Army community. We bring vital Army conversations and interviews on issues relevant to soldiers, military families, and all of you amazing Army supporters. Rotating each week, our show includes Soldier Today, Leading Great Teams, Family Voices, and Thought Leaders. Let's tune into the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Army Matters. I'm Colonel Retired Scott Halstead, your Leading Great Teams host, and today I'm honored to have a discussion with an incredible senior leader. Major General Diana Holland serves as the Commanding General of the Mississippi Valley Division of the United States Army Corps of Engineers. Her great team stretches the entire length of the Mississippi River and includes portions of 12 states. In her previous role as the Commanding General of the South Atlantic Division, she and her team played a significant role safeguarding American citizens and restoring vital services in the aftermath of Hurricanes Irma, Maria, Florence, Michael, and Dorian from 2017 through 2019. General Holland has built and led cohesive, effective, and honorable teams at every level from platoon to division over her 32-year career. She has also deployed multiple times to Iraq and Afghanistan. Ma'am, I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. You've had a much bigger role in my life than you realize as my boss at West Point, as a role model, and as a friend. Scott, thanks for having me on. I appreciate the invitation. It's great to talk to you again. I often Think about our shared experience at West Point a few years ago. The team there was successful with your input and your amazing contributions and service. So really, I'm honored that you would think of me to join you today. As you look back over the course of your career, what are some of the really memorable leader development experiences that you went through and what kind of impact did they have on you at that stage in your career and perhaps today as a senior leader? You know, it is really hard to narrow down what would be the most memorable. I would say that it really has been a 32 years of leader development events. I would single out perhaps a couple of them. One would be the teaching assignment at West Point. As a captain and junior major from 99 to 02, I taught in the history department. And it turned out to be one of the most profoundly influential experiences in my career. But the thing it taught me that I wasn't expecting it to teach me was the importance of mentorship and how to be one. And maybe I'm I came late to that realization. Maybe most people get that even earlier on as a lieutenant and captain. But for some reason, I didn't value it the way that I learned to value it because I was now standing on the podium in front of cadets. The cadets taught me how to be a mentor and why it was important and to really value that close relationship and developmental opportunity. You know, I didn't expect to walk away a better leader than I was when I got there, but I definitely was. I think every command and leadership opportunity is an event that makes us better leaders, but battalion command, commanding the 92nd Engineer Battalion at Fort Stewart, Georgia, and then taking it to Afghanistan I had the incredible privilege of commanding that unit for three years because of that deployment. Some of the takeaways were, you know, the heroism of our soldiers. And and I don't just mean heroism in the sense of, you know, advancing towards the enemy. I mean it from the resiliency they demonstrate, the incredible requirements that we put on them and they persevere their enthusiasm and their passion to be the best possible soldiers they can be. When I got to that unit, they had just come off, I don't know, their sixth, maybe their sixth deployment in eight years. It was the most deployed engineer unit in the Army. And they were um, a very challenged unit. They were not a safe unit. The 92nd Engineer Battalion had the reputation on Fort Stewart for having the most blotter entries every single day. And these were not small things. These were DUIs, these were cocaine, distribution of cocaine, violence. The uh, Pizza Hut delivery guy would not deliver pizza to our barracks at a concern, the reputation of our barracks. That's the situation Command Sergeant Major Ron Patterson and I walked into. It was a unit that had been through so much. We had the opportunity to rehabilitate or discharge some of those young men and women who weren't up to it. 
get a lot of soldiers the help they needed, the counseling they needed, the medical care they needed. But over that first year of command, the unit went from about, you know, 700 down to 200. And so at one point, we knew everybody really, really well. And then the Army started sending new soldiers. And we had the opportunity to build that unit really from the base, from a really foundational unit. And, you know, educate on values, lay the groundwork for what we expected of them, how to be safe, how, you know, what care means that we were able to do that over the course of that second year. Then about midway through that second year, we were probably up to about 700 folks by then. Then we learned that we were going to deploy to Afghanistan. And so both Sergeant Major Patterson and I were both extended a third year. And so you know, it was so meaningful to me to be able to go with this unit that we had kind of raised. It felt like raising kids who are now adults, and now you're going to take them on this incredibly consequential mission. We were a surge unit into eastern Afghanistan during the buildup in 2010. And um, if I had at the beginning said, you know, what do you want out of this experience? What do you hope will be the outcome for the soldiers? Of course, number one would be, I just really want everybody to come home in one piece. You don't, be careful not to say that in public, but deep down, that's what we all want. But you also want them to have an impact on for the warfighter. As an engineer, you want to be able to provide everything the warfighter needs to make them successful. And as it turned out, that's how it all ended. It was an incredibly meaningful bonding experience. I learned from my soldiers. There was a moment when I knew there was a mission we shouldn't have been tasked to do. I really wrestled with how I was going to respond to that. I was really troubled by it. You know, it was keeping me up at night. I was really worried. I know it was affecting my health. And I happened to be in the motor pool checking equipment, it's all getting lined up, making sure every, you know, ratchet straps, all that stuff is good to go. And, you know, it's probably a couple nights out from this mission we were going to go on. And I ran into a soldier who at home station was not our best soldier. He was one of the (laughs) ones that we had to keep an eye on. He was always in trouble, not bad trouble, but on the edge. And I saw him in the motor pool and he's all, he is checking stuff too. He's, He's like acting like a leader. I said, um, you know, what are you doing out here? I'm just checking things over. I just, I want to make sure this goes right. I know this really matters. And I said, you seem really motivated to be truthful. I'm really worried. I'm I'm worried for you. And his response was, you know, ma'am, I joined the army to do this. I don't belong on this fob behind the protection of the gates and the the walls or, or in this motor pool. You know, my purpose is to be out there doing what we do best to support the warfighter. You don't need to worry about us. I didn't know what to say. I mean, that was one of those, you need a mission done, send me. And that, I mean, that just, I felt uh, a lot better. I slept a lot better after that. And I've thought about him ever since. There's a tough mission to do, send me. That is the attitude of the American soldier. And that is why our army is always successful. And so, you know, what's the lesson from that is never underestimate the spirit of your soldiers, no matter what their rank is, no matter how they might behave in certain scenarios. Ma'am, I love that story. But I would argue don't underestimate the spirit of the commander. We'll dive into our next topic after this quick break. Have you purchased your AUSA swag yet? Be proud to show your support for AUSA which in turn shows your support for the U.S. Army and our soldiers. Check out all AUSA swag at shop.ausa.org. Ma'am, you talked about what you learned about really being a leader and mentorship when you were a member of the faculty of the Department of History at West Point. But I'd really like to hear about what you learned about leadership when you served as the Commandant Cadets at West Point. I don't know if I have enough time today to talk about everything I learned from being the Commandant. First of all, it is truly a world-class institution. Our country is lucky to have all of the service academies, but of course I know the most about West Point. One of the takeaways was the leaders who have brought West Point through 
many different eras and changes in our society, how they have done that so masterfully, balancing, I think it's a requirement to maintain tradition, to maintain the trappings of West Point, because there are <laughs> young people and their parents are attracted to West Point because of the history, its attachment to custom and tradition and all of those things. But balancing that with the, the mandate to be competitive to other opportunities in America, whether it's going to a top tier university, embarking on other careers, doing, you know, there's just so many opportunities, of course, in America for talented young people. And so it's got to be competitive got to have the funding to have state-of-the-art academic facilities. It's got to have state-of-the-art sports complexes. It's got to have the best of military training. It's got to have all those things. We need more young people to volunteer to join the Army. And so we have the recognition, the long view of how do we make sure 20 years from now that we are going to be the option of choice for future generations requires quite a balance. And there's all kinds of people who will contribute their opinions to the senior leaders at West Point. I won't name them, but you know kind of the <laughs> categories I'm talking about. I do. And so input's important. You got to listen. And uh, there's a lot of good ideas that come in, but you also got to have the perspective of this is for the future of the Army. This is for the future of West Point. And sometimes we have to let go of some things that we've always done in order to fit something in that's important to make adaptable, creative, innovative, fit leaders of character for the future. The younger generation, I think it's good to be around young officers or, or cadets. Uh, it keeps us grounded. They are just as patriotic and devoted and passionate about our country, about our national security, about our objectives as any previous generation. They are joining in a period of war. Certainly while I was there, they were still coming to West Point, knowing that they were likely going to go to a combat zone. I was inspired by the Corps of Cadets in that they came in expecting that men and women are going to do the same things and have the same requirements. What I figured out from that was it was just the old folks that had reservations about women doing certain things. You know, while we were there, we integrated women into mandatory boxing. Yes, ma'am. The amount of time we spent worrying and wringing our hands about what the reaction was going to be, we spent too much time doing that. It was really, we were transferring our own nervousness and anxiety onto a generation that did not understand why 40 years after women first entered West Point, that they were still, they were not going through that particular experience. So it was really an honor to be part of that transition. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, I remember going to the very first day of the first boxing class that had men and women in it. And you would have thought it was the most natural thing in the world. They paired up with somebody that was of, of similar size and experience. They were no uh, more afraid than the guys were. It was so natural and they really embraced it. We got to be careful that we don't transfer our own anxieties and worries and on a younger generation that really does expect men and women to be doing the same things. If you remember, we would go out and speak to our alumni regularly, you as the commandant and me as a colonel at West Point. And ma'am, I used to bait them. Because they all want to talk about the core has and West Point just isn't the same when I was there in the 50s or 60s or 70s. And uh, and so, ma'am, I would just show picture after picture of men and women, mostly young graduates that had done multiple combat deployments, many of whom had been grievously wounded and most of them who stayed in uniform in spite of missing limbs and significant you know, injuries. And it shut them up quickly. And what I explained to them is they are different from us. This generation is different. I would argue they're better than us. They know exactly what we're getting into. And as you talked about with your soldiers in the 92nd Engineer Battalion, they want to serve. They want to be challenged. And so I, ma'am, I'm the same way. I walked away inspired every day I served at West Point. And I'm so thankful for, for those young people that raised their right hand. And you know as well as I do, they're making a difference in our Army today. 
they're making our army better. And so I'm thankful that we had a small part in that. You as the commandant and me uh, as a member of your team a few years ago. So, ma'am, let's transition to what you're doing today. How do you develop leaders within your current team and what's your audience? I mean, you've got leaders in uniform, you've got DA civilians, and it's just it's massive, the enterprise. So how do you practice mission command and how do you develop your leaders? A lot of people don't know what the Corps of Engineers is. In fact, uh, many people in the Army don't know what the Corps of Engineers is. Many engineer officers don't fully understand what the Corps of Engineers is. So the Corps is under the Department of Defense. It's under the Army. It's historical. Our nation was expanding, developing waterways, the westward expansion. The engineers were in the army. And so the nation leveraged army officers to do a lot of the tasks that required to build the lay the foundation for a young nation. So that was the genesis. And so we're the only country in the world where the army does this domestic work. We are also the envy of the world. If you talk to ministries of defense around the world who know anything about the Corps of Engineers and what we do to support the nation, They wish they had something like this because uh, we're just a really good execution arm for all these big things. It is 98% civilian, 2% wear a uniform like I do. Most of us are commanders. So a question I'm asked from my civilians is, what was it like coming from the Army into the (laughs) Corps, and now you got all these civilians? You're still in the Army. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think they think I'm going to say, oh, yeah, y'all aren't very disciplined. You know, you don't get up and do PT at 630, that I'm in, you know, s- formations, anything like that. You know, it is really not much different than being in a uniformed organization. The civilians of the Corps of Engineers are professionals who want to make us proud of them, who are so devoted to our country giving the right engineering solutions for our nation, for our economy, just all the things they do. But I am as inspired by our Army civilians as I am by our soldiers. It's just a wonderful program. The Corps also takes very seriously mentoring. So it is something that every employee hears about. It is something that supervisors are expected to employ and and be a part of the mentoring process. Again, the Corps is better than that when compared to other federal agencies, probably because it's part of the Army, and that's what the Army brings to the organization. So I would summarize the Corps, one last positive thing to say about the Corps. I think one of the reasons it's so successful and has is so trusted by the American people and our Congress, I mean, it is effective because it combines all of the strengths of two cultures, the civilians, the longtime serving civilians that are extraordinarily competent, educated, and professional with Army leaders. I call us tempires because we come in for two or three years and then we're gone. We bring a leadership aspect, all those other things that are obvious to us on the uniform side, and it's a marrying up of the magic of those two cultures you're leading such a diverse organization, but you're the boss. And so this culture of trust, which I know you bring to all your organizations where you underwrite, you know, honest mistakes and your teammates know that they can make mistakes from trying too hard, that you and your subordinate commanders will allow them to to learn and grow from those mistakes, I think is why, you know, sounds like that's why your team is so successful because they know my commander, my commanding general has my back. And so long as we follow our organizational values, we're going to be just fine. Ma'am, I know you're a big reader, and so I'd love to hear, and I ask this of all the senior leaders I interview, what do you love to read? What inspires you? And do you give books out to to teammates? And if so, what books do you give out? There's so many, but I'll narrow it down to three. When I was a graduate student at Duke, I became a big fan of Duke basketball and remain that. And from that experience, I read Leading with the Heart by Coach K, West Point graduate, class of 69. He certainly had an impact on West Point in a number of different ways, and West Point had an impact on him. That was one of the first books I read. I got leadership lessons from that wasn't from a military leader. Every commander that works for me, I give them a copy of it. I really like the book Quiet by Susan Cain. The book is about introverts, 
and why our Western culture has really come to value the more extroverted, charismatic, dominating personality type. Where that came from, it wasn't always true about American leaders. It's a relatively recent development. I mean, recent, a century or so. I'm an introvert, so that's one of the reasons why it appeals to me. But I think everybody needs to appreciate this a little better because I think if we really took a poll and figured out the statistics of our organizations, we have a lot more introverts on our teams than we recognize. They don't talk about it because they feel like they're not supposed to be an introvert if you're in the army. But, you know, how much more powerful we can be as a team and an organization if we understand each other. And then the third one is How Women Rise by Sally Helgeson. I generally have stayed away from books that tend to separate by demographic that somehow characterize behavior as being connected to a particular gender or other demographic. But this one was a little bit different. They talk about 12 tendencies that they see, generally speaking, in women. And not that every woman has all 12, but there's probably one or two that are relevant to us and that hold us back. So I've started recommending that to everybody, whether you are a woman or you're leading women, it's really, it's something that makes you stop and think and can help you, you know, how do I help another woman professional be confident in the next step? Or as a, if I were a male leader, you know, what advice can I give? Yes, ma'am. So I've read Leading with the Heart. It is a phenomenal book. And I've picked up Quiet, but I put it down. So now I'm going to pick it up again. I'm going to add that to my fresh read list. And ma'am, you know my family. I've got three adult women in the house. And so I'm going to buy How Women Rise. And I'm going to share it with my adult daughters because I love that message of the sky's the limit. I've loved this conversation. And I've taken a bunch of notes. And I've got some homework now to go back and, and think deeply about a couple of these subjects. Ma'am, do you have any closing comments? Anything you want to share with our listeners? You know, I can't say enough how much the Army has meant to me. I've wanted to be a soldier since I was six years old. I am so appreciative of what the Army has given me, the opportunities it has given me and my family. The Army has so many opportunities for all Americans of all different backgrounds, of all different demographics. It has truly been everything that I hoped it would be. I have so much confidence in the future of our Army the future of our nation. We are better than ever. And I'll use your phrase, the sky is truly the limit. Yes, ma'am. So for our listeners that have never had the opportunity or privilege to serve with General Holland, she's not very tall. Ma'am, you're 5'4", five, 5'5"? Five, five? <laughs> I wish. No, I'm 5'1". I'm okay. Well, from my perspective, there's no one bigger in my 30 years in the Army. There's no one bigger who has displayed unyielding optimism who has built, led, and earned the trust of her bosses and her subordinates, and who has really inspired thousands of young people through her personal example by setting and enforcing high standards and then demanding it from her team. And so, ma'am, thank you so much for what you've done for me and for our Army. And and ma'am, I'll just share this with you, and I've never told you this. Two of the most difficult moral ethical decisions I've ever faced in the Army was when you were my boss. I knew the harder right from the easier wrong, as did you, but these were unpopular things. And when I brought these two more ethical challenges to you, you didn't bat an eye. And you said, let's go talk to the rest of the leader team about this. And so I will always have tremendous respect for you that when some leaders would waver, not you. you. You knew exactly what had to be done, what the mission demanded, what the team demanded. And for that, I'll always be thankful. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Army Matters podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. The Army Matters podcast series is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission to educate, inform, and connect with the total Army our industry partners, and our supporters of a strong national defense. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at Have a great Army Day. Hua.